Welcome to this case study lecture on the German Maritime Spatial Plan. My name is Miriam Fontin and I'm a postdoc at the Leibniz Institute for Baltic Sea Research in Warnemünde, Germany. In this case study, I will introduce you to German Maritime Spatial Planning. I will talk about the consultation process for the updated Maritime Spatial Plan before presenting how this plan actually looks like. Then I will show some more details uh, on the German Maritime Spatial Plan from an environmental perspective, perspective. And in the end, I will provide some evaluation of the German Maritime Spatial Plan with respect to strengths and weaknesses, but also in comparison to other Maritime Spatial Plans in the Baltic Sea, and also with respect to using MSP as a tool for marine environmental management. Why a case study on the German MSP? The main reason is that uh, Germany is a pioneer when it comes to MSP because they have uh, or they are among the countries in the EU that have started MSP quite early. So, for example, the German Spatial Act was made applicable to the exclusive economic zone already in 2004. The first Maritime Spatial Plan for the Territorial Sea was adopted in 2005. And then the first plan for the exclusive economic zone was adapted adopted in 2009. And the reason why um, Germany was quite early with MSP was that they needed an instrument to guide the approval procedures for infrastructures at sea, so mainly wind farms. So when in 2014 the EU adopted the Maritime Special Planning Directive, Germany already had its um, MSP in place. And then just last year, so in 2021, all EU member states had to finalize their maritime spatial plans. And in that year, Germany already adopted its um, sort of second round of MSP in the exclusive economic zone. Who is responsible for maritime spatial planning in Germany? The responsibilities are divided between the federal government and the coastal states. So in the Baltic Sea, um, Schleswig-Holstein and Mecklenburg, uh, Western Pomerania are responsible for planning in the territorial seas. In the North Seas, uh, or in the North Sea, uh, these are Schleswig-Holstein as well and Lower Saxony. And then the Federal Ministry of Interior Building and Community is responsible for maritime spatial planning in the exclusive economic zone and the Federal Maritime and Hydrographic Agency is responsible for drafting the plan for the exclusive economic zone. And in the following, I will focus just on the plans for the exclusive economic zone and the new plans that were adopted in 2021. The plan from 2021 was guided by a vision to use and preserve the sea in all its diversity. And according to the German Spatial Planning Act, MSP is supposed to support the safety and efficiency of navigation, other economic uses, especially renewable energy, scientific uses, especially marine research, and also security aspects, in particular national and alliance defense. But MSP should also contribute to the protection and enhancement of the marine environment through spatial designations for the marine environment, but also through designations for avoiding and mitigating harmful impacts and pollutions resulting from the above mentioned uses. What is interesting to note about the plan from 2021 is that it was guided by a vision and this vision clearly reflects sort of the aim of MSP, which is to, to hold the use and preservation of marine areas in balance. But throughout this presentation, I will show why it's questionable if this vision can actually be achieved with the current plan. 
But what are some of the current drivers and uses in the German seas and for German maritime spatial planning? So the drivers are safe and efficient navigation, marine protection, commerce, and offshore wind park planning. And one of the main issues is indeed also the grid connections for the offshore wind farms and also to plan for the future development of offshore wind farms. Why is there such a strong focus on offshore wind development? It's because it is seen as almost the solution to combat climate change or at least to contribute to reaching the climate targets of cutting carbon emissions. And on this graph here, you can see the development goals for offshore wind development um, from the previous German government, which aimed at establishing or installing 40 gigawatts um, of wind energy by 2040. So we can certainly say that offshore wind development is a very or almost the most important driver for German MSP. But of course, there are also other uses such as sand and gravel extraction, shipping, fishing, nature protection and tourism. And MSP, of course, needs to balance all of these uh, different interests, which is done through a MSP process. And here on this graph, you can see sort of the MSP process that led up to uh, the finalization of the plan for the German EEZ. And here I would just like to focus on some of the aspects. So one aspect um, is the development of planning options which is certainly an improvement compared to the previous um, MSP plan, which did not have these uh, different uh, scenarios for the use of the sea and the scenarios that were used in the plan from last year and that was adopted last year are is one scenario focusing on traditional uses. So mainly shipping, which enjoys priority in this scenario. And there was a scenario on climate protection, mainly through offshore wind farms, and one scenario on nature protection. And then different stakeholder groups could comment on these planning scenarios and also on the different um, drafting rounds. And with respect uh, to the consultation process, um, it's possible to say that it was quite uh, transparent and um, some more aspects um, regarding the consultation process. So it started off uh, with a series of thematic workshops and expert discussions um, on topics like shipping, nature protection, offshore wind farm development, other industrial sectors, but also military, etc. And then all the stakeholders issued statements on the draft plans and all these statements are available online for everyone to read. And you can also read the replies from the federal agency. And also, yeah, the evaluation is available online. And the statements that were issued from the stakeholders included statements from NGOs, from industry, academia, ministries, as well as governmental agencies, municipalities, the military, and also statements from two citizens. If you read all these statements and also the replies, it becomes quite clear that this balance of interest, it's a complex and very difficult task, and it's almost not possible to satisfy everyone's or even anyone's needs and interests. And what is also interesting to observe is that there are varying alliances between the sectors when it comes to what should or what should not be allowed with, um, in the context of MSP. So just a point in case, for example, is that the wind park operators and the NGOs agree that fishing should not be allowed inside wind parks. But then when it comes to allowing wind parks inside nature protection areas, there's a huge disagreement between the wind park operators and the NGOs. This uh, map now shows how the plan actually looks like. So it shows um, the maritime spatial plan for the EZ in the Baltic Sea. And as you can see, it, 
the EAZ only covers a rather narrow area in the Baltic Sea. And the plan provides special designations, so mainly priority areas and reservation areas. So for example, in blue, you can see the priority areas for shipping, in orange, the priority areas for wind parks, and in green, the priority areas for nature conservation. And in these priority areas, the respective use has priority over other uses. Um, as long or some of the uses can be or some other uses can be permitted in the priority areas, but only as long as they do not conflict with the priority use. And then the reservation areas, there the use have only priorities to some extent or just for a limited period of time. So the plan consists of these sort of maps of uh, the exclusive economic zones with the um, different spatial designations, but there's, there are also accompanying documents and textual specifications. And here important are the planning objectives and principles where the objectives to have a higher priority or are more binding than the principles. On this map, you can see the plan for the North Sea, so for the EZ in the North Sea. And in the following, I will show some more details um, from the North, North Sea, um, simply because it's easier to see on this map because the exclusive economic zone covers a larger area in the North Sea. And if you're not familiar with MSP, you may be a bit surprised by these maps because they show actually a lot of overlapping uses. And you may think that you know, MSP should aim for non-overlapping uses, but this is only partly right. So what MSP wants to achieve is to avoid overlapping uses that conflict with each other. Though, of course, uh, there might be quite different opinions about whether or not one use conflicts with another. And in the North Sea, for example, we have overlapping uses between shipping and nature protection, and also between wind parks and nature protection. And in the following, I will explain in a bit, bit more detail the reasoning behind these uh, designations. So on this map, you can see the designations for shipping, which are mainly based on the current ship traffic and also the based on the security zones around shipping lanes. And what you could see on the previous map is that there are overlaps between shipping and nature protection areas. And in the plan, it says that um, in the case when there are overlaps between these priority areas, that shipping always enjoys priority because of the freedom of shipping as postulated in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. However, it's not quite right to say that shipping per se enjoys priority over nature protection. It's just right to say that one country alone is not allowed to restrict shipping from certain areas. But there are instruments in place from the International Maritime Organization, so the IMO, which can declare areas to be avoided. So what we see here is that MSP can keep areas free for shipping, but cannot really alone regulate shipping traffic. Um, the APTA, so the areas to be avoided, are an instrument to regulate shipping traffic to some extent. And in the statements, um, or in the replies from the federal agency to the statements from some of the stakeholders, you can read that there might be attempts in the future to use this instrument from the IMO, but it does require a lengthy process and also an extensive international consultation, which was um, not attempted in this round of MSP. On this map, you can see the designation areas for offshore wind farm. And what is interesting here is actually also the difference between the plan from 2009 and now the new plan because in 2009, there was a principle that wind farms should not be allowed outside their priority areas, 
in nature to thousand areas. And there's no such a, such principle in the plan from 2021, which was criticized by NGOs because it lowers the protection status of the nature protection areas, especially so because the Federal Environmental Act is actually not that uh, protective. Another difference is that now in the new plan, fishery or passive fishery is allowed inside the security or safety zones of the wind parks. And what does it, uh, what that means is um, that there is really an expansion of offshore wind farm because it is seen as the solution to combat climate change. And because the wind parks need space, you know, that it's now possible to combine them with more uses. Here you can see the designations for nature protection. Um, there's certainly one improvement, and that is that now in the new plan, we have principles and objectives for nature protection. And I, as I said before, the objectives are more binding. Uh, what is also an improvement is that now the Natura 2000 areas, which are the solid green areas on the map, are yeah, not just depicted on the map, but they are actually designated as priority areas. And furthermore, we also have priority areas for harbor purposes and priority areas as well as reservation areas for diving seabirds. However, we still also see that many uses are not ruled out in the protected areas. So what we can say is, yes, the MSP designations have improved, but there's still overall weak protection, at least at this level of planning. Uh, point in case is that now there's also a suitability study for investigating whether a wind park can be located or can be built in the protected area of the Dogger Bank, so in this uh, red circle up there. And what we also see is that um, nat or national as well as international targets for biodiversity protection are not uh, reflected at this planning level. What do I mean with the different planning levels? So in Germany, it is so that we have the maritime spatial plan sort of as an umbrella. And then in subordinate planning, we still have the sector planning. And for example, in the case of offshore wind, it's a site development plan is drafted. And what is quite in interesting here is that the maritime spatial plan was based on development targets um, from the previous government. And now with the, with the site development um, draft, they already include the new targets, which says, and I quote, that in order to achieve the expansion target of 70 gigawatts by 2045, specified in the coalition agreement, a considerable number of additional areas must be developed for the expansion of offshore wind energy. So what we can see is that there is an increase of the development goals. So in the, the MSP plan is based on this um, aim of 40 gigawatts by 2040, whereas the site development plan for offshore wind is based on the goals um, which um, aim for installing 70 gigawatts by 2045. This has been criticized to some extent, um, also because, for example, the Federal Agency for Nature Protection states that MSP should not just look where is the use possible, but also whether a use is actually necessary. And while there's no doubt that we need offshore wind as well to combat climate change, it does seem like it's uh, as if it is a case of not in my backyard because the development on land has come to a an halt and now it seems that the solution is to push everything to the sea. But of course, the seas also have a natural capacity of carbon storage, like with different marine habitats, such as seagrasses, but this is not as well reflected in the MSP plan. So there are certainly some strengths and weaknesses when it comes to the German MSP. 
And this list is not supposed to be a comprehensive list, but um, I will just talk about some of the strengths and weaknesses. So one strength is that there was this development of planning scenarios, which allows you, you know, to assess uh, the impacts of different scenarios on the marine environment, um, which is furthermore also an aspect of an ecosystem-based approach to MSP. What we can also say is that, um, at least with respect to like the statements and replies that were issued in the consultation process, there was uh, quite a transparency because they are all available online. And also um, the international consultation documents are available online. And what I think is really an advantage also is that the plans are not just available in German or English, which you uh, could expect, but also in Danish and Polish, so the direct neighbors of Germany. What is more, the plan is based on a vision for the planning area. This is certainly a strength. And from an environmental point of view, it is also very needed, or it was very needed, that the priority and reservation areas uh, were also used or applied to nature protection areas. And we have also the environmental reports, which are all available online and which you can read, which also explains um, to what extent or how the ecosystem-based approach was implemented. However, there are also some weaknesses. So first of all, there was a weak public consultation, which you could see that you know there were only two statements from citizens. Uh, of course, it also depends on the interest from the public, but there was neither an apparent attempt from the federal agency to actually involve the public uh, more actively. Then what we also see is that there's an insufficient implementation of the ecosystem-based approach. So yes, the ecosystem-based approach is mentioned in the environmental reports and also explained, but there it also says that you know, some elements could not be included because of a lack of data and also supposedly because of a lack of proven concepts. Though on the next slide, I will show you that some countries have uh, sort of more innovative approaches here. Uh, what we can also say is that there is an imbalance towards the use of the marine areas and available measures to restrict certain uses such as uh, shipping have at least not yet been applied. So we can say that the German MSP is rather an integrated use MSP than an ecosystem-based MSP. And this focus on an integrated use MSP um, is quite common throughout Europe, also because of the EU MSP directive. But we cannot say that sort of the German plan is representative of all the other plans. Of course, there are certain elements which they all have in common. But it is also so that they are very much um, sort of adapted to the uh, planning practices in the respective countries. And this was also sort of supported by the EU MSP directive, which is a so-called new generation directive, which just means that the EU member states are more flexible in implementing the directive according to the um, sort of planning practices in their countries. What it means among others, for example, is that, um, and here an example from the Baltic Sea is that, you know, even uh, the ministries under which MSP is placed can differ quite considerably. So in the MSP, we can say that roughly half of the countries have placed MSP under the responsibility of uh, the Ministry of Environment, whereas the other half have uh, placed it under the responsibility of the Ministry of Economics. And arguably, this can influence the balance of interests. What we can also say is that, yes, Germany is certainly a pioneer for MSP because they have a long history of um, MSP, or at least a longer one than most countries. But we also see, if you have a look at the other Baltic Sea countries, that there are also other pioneers in or with respect to applying more innovative concepts. For example, Latvia and Sweden have assessed marine ecosystem services sort of as a basis for MSP 
though admittedly they have not fully incorporated it in the later plans, but at least they did have a go at it. And what we also see is that Sweden has developed this cumulative impact assessment tool, which sort of allows you to assess the combined effects of all uses and then provides valuable information for MSP. What can we say about the planning in the Baltic Sea as a whole or the coherence between the different plans? It is so that the international consultation, which is required uh, in the MSP processes and also the transboundary cooperation within EU project, projects has certainly increased coherence between the plans, but we can still see that there are some mismatches um, and transboundary designations, except maybe for shipping, do not really exist, but which would really be needed, especially for natural protection areas. Because uh, one um, strong point, for example, in the German MSP is that they have these bird migration corridors in the Baltic Sea, sort of designated in the plan, but then these corridors are not extended across the border. What can we say about MSP as a tool for marine management, or for marine environmental management, I should say? So we can certainly say that MSP coordinates uses and ensures efficient use of space, which is very much needed, because all the uses would take place without MSP anyways, but then uncoordinated with higher environmental impacts. We can also say that the spatial designations provide planning security also for nature protection, or at least they can or have the possibility to add an extra level of uh, protection. And what we can also say is that uh, an ecosystem-based approach to MSP sort of also evaluates the impacts of the uses and says that it should be within the limits of an ecosystem or in the words of the Marine Strategy Framework Directive, which is sort of the environmental marine management directive in the EU, um, MSP should also ensure that the achievement of a good ecological status um, is not jeopardized. However, what we do see is that the ecosystem-based MSP is not fully implemented, so there are weaknesses with the implementation. And of course, the MSFD is only one pillar of MSP, and the other, uh, other pillar is uh, more focused on economic use of the seas, uh, so on blue growth, or as it is called now, blue sustainable development. And it depends very much on the countries to what extent um, these interests are balanced. And for example, what we see in Germany is that the restriction of uses in marine areas are often delegated to other, le to other levels of planning. So we can conclude that MSP is certainly a very much needed and necessary tool, but the realization of its potential for an ecosystem-based management very much depends depends on how it is being implemented in the countries and also on the prevailing planning practices in the countries. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention.